Okay, as we mentioned, the only asterisk behind, beside Governor Palazzo's uh, weakening growth forecast for Canada is the size and potential wallop that might be coming out of the spring's stimulus budget, if that's what indeed happens. That leaves any silver lining in these clouds up to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, coming out this spring with that. To discuss this topic and more, let's bring in the MPs. Stephen McKinnon is a Liberal MP. Lisa Raitt is the finance critic for the official opposition. She joins us from Vancouver and in Montreal. Guy Caron is the NDP finance critic. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Lisa Raitt. Uh, the government uh, needs to stimulate. That seems to be a consensus here. Um, where's the magic mark here? How, how far does Canada go into the red to stimulate an economy when it's not really in a recession yet? That's the point, Don. We're not in a recession. I don't even know if it's going to be a yet. We're still seeing growth. We're seeing some strong growth in Ontario and Quebec. But what we definitely see, and we've been talking about this consistently the last couple of weeks, is we see a real problem with the loss of jobs in Alberta, and Newfoundland, and Labrador. This is a crisis. That is the crisis that the government has to focus on to ensure that those people who are losing their jobs, they're given what's happening in their particular sector, that there's a plan so that they may be able to get back to work. And it's more than just infrastructure, Don. Infrastructure is a small piece of it, and it's not as broad as it was when we did it in 2008. There has to be some plan to deal with what's happening in the oil and gas sector in Alberta, Newfoundland, Labrador, and Saskatchewan in order to ensure that people have some hope for what's going to happen in the future in their families. All right, to stimulate and where to stimulate, that is the question here, Guy Caron. Uh, what's the NDP view of what the government needs to do in this budget in a couple months? Well, even before the budget, there could be some action. Uh, we're all in favor of infrastructure spending, and it has to take place. Uh, on the other side, uh, you, you just don't shovel money to shovel money and to say that you, you have spent. It needs to be, those need to be actually productive infrastructure uh, improvements that will actually bring people to work, but will also increase productivity. So you need to select the right projects for this. And my fear is that we don't have enough at this point, uh, enough shovel-ready projects for doubling of the infrastructure money, which is what the Liberals committed to. One thing that they could do right now, and it goes back to uh, the difficulties that Alberta Newfoundland and Labrador are going through would be a reversal of the measures taken back in 2012 on EI that restricted accessibility to EI. Uh, right now, people in Alberta and Newfoundland uh, especially are hurting, and it might actually be a good thing for the Liberals to announce that reversal, increasing accessibility and ensuring that money would actually go to the people who need them, uh, who need it, uh, but also that will be spent in the communities that are also hurting right now. All right, Stephen, I, I can't imagine we'd stay at $10 billion given these economic numbers in terms of the cap uh, for a deficit. Uh, is there a sense that where they're going to go up to? How, how high could this budget stimulate? Well, look, what we know is we're going to stick to our plan. Uh, the government had, uh, has laid out, uh, and Minister Morneau has laid out uh, pretty uh, uh, three very clear principles in terms of the deficit. But what we do know, and my colleagues on the panel are kind of breaking down an open door here, uh, in ter uh, whether it's investment in jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Caron talks about the EI program. We talked, I think, presciently in the campaign about, uh, about looking at uh, uh, ways to uh, soften EI eligibility for seasonal workers, rural workers commodities workers. We have our ear cocked, uh, uh, Don, to Western Canada and the oil and gas and commodity sector, but the commodity sector is all over Canada. Uh, and we know uh, that uh, measures are going to be need, to, uh, need to be taken. Uh, Mr. Palaz talked about that today in his report. Uh, take up that slack in the Canadian economy. Infrastructure spending, tax cuts, investments in our families that are going to take hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty. All of those things are going to be stimulative, and all of those things are going to help us get traverse or get through this uh, period of low commodity prices. The Liberal plan is exactly the plan we need to stick to. Well, Lisa right there's an abacus poll that shows 50% of Canadians, or almost 50%, support the idea of some stimulus in this spring budget. I guess the question is, as you pointed out, you know, we have a problem in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. uh, is that where it should be concentrated or exclusively dealt with? Are the other provinces strong enough that they don't need it? 
So governments have an overarching policy that you bring in from your election campaign. We're not in a campaign anymore, Don. Now the government has to deal with real-world crises that's happening. And I'll tell you, on this Davos trip, while we agree that the Davos gathering is extremely important for ministers, I have to note that the one minister left behind is the Minister of Natural Resources in charge of our oil and gas sector and in charge of our pipelines in this country. That's a very clear signal to the world that it's not just about Canada being diverse, which is a great message to send. It's about the fact that, guess what, oil and gas, we no longer want you. We're not going to put any attention to you as a sector that we care about in the country. So for you in Alberta, you in Newfoundland and Labrador, you in New Brunswick, uh, sorry, but we're going to change things up, and we hope that we get you something coming your way, and it may not come your way. That's an interesting observation. I hadn't noticed that, but uh, well, that's of course, your thoughts? That's of course absurd. Jim Carr is not uh, there. Uh, he Mr. always Mr. Carr went. has been all over. Mr. Carr has been all over uh, the oil patch, all over Western Canada. Right, he's not and in Davos. As, and is consulting he's not widely. Selling. I he's think not we, uh, Canada was look. Canada was very no. well represented at Davos. One thing we didn't do is cut pensions in Davos. What we did is went and tried to attract attention to Canada. Tried to attract Most investment to Canada. Most important sales calls tried to promote for Canada, Canada, and you don't send and, them. Hang on, Lisa. Uh, What's and, said? and uh, Minister, Minister Carr has focused, I think, very, very close, uh, very, very uh, closely on on uh, this issue of getting uh, our resources to market. Something that he will continue to do. Something that was in his mandate letter. So wow. the oil and gas sector, the commodity sector, which is all over Canada, uh, is something that we are going to be focusing on very clearly. But there, uh, the Bank of Canada today says there will be slack in the economy due to the world prices, due to the slackening demand in Asia. Yeah. And what we're going to be doing is helping Helping to fill that gap and what I'm hearing on this panel beyond a, a lot of the heat and light is uh, a lot of agreement with stimulus with tax cuts with uh, social programs and other well, things that are going to help us get through it has, this. It has to be done right. Stephen, it has to be done right. I mean uh, there will be a report coming from the PBO tomorrow, the Parliamentary Budget Officer, that will talk about how the tax cut that was implemented by uh, by your government will actually, uh, how it will be divided. And it's obvious that when it goes to uh, the people who need it most, it will be spent. If you're going to be giving the benefits to the people who are uh, higher up in incomes, it will be spent less and there will be less bang for, uh, for the buck. Uh, th this is why I'm actually putting an emphasis on the uh, right type of infrastructure. That uh, type of infrastructure it will, yes, create uh, construction, const construction jobs, for example, but also increase productivity and, and send us a clear signal to uh, Canadian businesses. A and in terms of Davos, uh, I'd like to point out that there was a missed opportunity here. Uh, what I heard from the speech from Mr. Trudeau was a lot of slogans, uh, good intentions, optimism, but not much substance. And one good action uh, coming from Davos would have been to actually, and you mentioned what happened three years ago when the announcement on pensions was made, when we said that we would be moving the eligibility to six, from 65 to 67. That would have been a perfect opportunity instead of just saying we're different from the Conservatives to actually make the announcement reversing the policy, which was also a commitment from the camping. Lisa Ray, I want to get one thought from you, and you brought this up. You said, look, yeah. he's ignoring oil, but doesn't, isn't mm -hmm. it incumbent on Justin Trudeau to try and sell Canada as something other than an energy superpower while he's in front of these leaders? Because clearly the way our loony is going, the business community believes that that's why we're a one-trick pony. I don't think people believe that at all, Don. I think they know that we're diverse, and I mentioned already that I applaud the Prime Minister for talking about our diversity, both in terms of what we have to offer economically, but as well what we offer in terms of a great people. But that being said, um, I think it's deafening when you forget to bring along the guy who can speak best for what you're really known for. Wouldn't it be a better situation if you really talk the, walk the walk in terms of striking a balance? If it is about responsible development of resources, along with the environmental aspects that go with it, why don't you bring both ministers like we used to bring to these conferences? I mean, that sends a better message that it's not just about the mining interests in Canada, I'm sure. And in terms of Stephen saying that there's a lot of heat and light on the panel, you know what, Stephen? Yep, I'm going to fight for people to make sure they keep their jobs because I grew up in Cape Breton where you lose your job, that was it. You had to leave the islands. And I don't think Albertans necessarily want to leave the provinces where they're bringing up their kids.
Well, of, co of course they don't, and that's a red herring, and that's exactly why we are going to be putting in place measures of, uh, across the country that are going to help pick up the slack in the economy in Western Canada, in Calgary, in Edmonton, and Saskatchewan. There are places that have lots of pent-up demand for infrastructure. There is available labor. We're, we have low interest rates. It's exactly the time to be putting in place the kinds of policies that the Liberal Party proposed. And uh, with respect to Davos, with all uh, respect to uh, Madam Raitt, the, the, the fact that we go to Canada now and talk about Canada, its diversity, the possibilities to invest in Canada, to talk about our knowledge economy, to talk about the kinds of innovation that, come out of, that comes out of, uh, of Canada, in addition to our commodity sector, and Mr. Trudeau did say that today yeah. in his speech, in addition to our commodity sector, is the kind of thing I think Canadians expect of their leader. And, and uh, just the last point on the ministers there, the Minister of Finance is there, the Minister of International Trade is there, the Minister of in Innovation is there, the Minister of the Environment yeah. is there. There. I think this is a bit of a canard. But I'll stick with you on this one because, you know, let's defend Stephen Harper a little bit on this. He, he was at Davos in 2012, and he spoke a lot about the need for other, other countries to stop taking their wealth for granted. He did announce that Canada was going to tackle things like retirement planning and immigration, that sort of thing. So it's kind of bogus to say that Stephen Harper went over there and said, as Justin Trudeau suggested, that while well, we're here to talk about being resourceful, not just resources, he, he, he dealt with a whole myriad of issues before. Well, I prefer to talk about what the Prime Minister is, uh, went there to say. Well, which he just Canada, that. Canada is open for business. Canada is much more. We it it has a great resources sector. It is much more than that. Yep. Yeah. It is a great model for yep. the world in terms of its diversity and True. its human, human capital. And uh, we're very, very proud of it. And having the Prime Minister as our chief salesman go around the world, meet with global leaders, I think is exactly the things Canadians expect Ye of him. Around it. Justin Trudeau miss anything today on his speech that you found particularly noteworthy? Well, it, the in, uh, income inequality and uh, it, it's a major... I, I know that we're talking about the fourth wave of uh, uh, the industrial... Uh, the, the fourth aspect of the industrial wave right now, but uh, the one of the issues that economists and, and world leaders have been spoken f uh, about for the last year or so and even a year and a half is the impact of income inequality and that part actually was missing this is why I actually mentioned that uh, the speech was a missed opportunity in terms of reversing the policy uh, of, uh, of pushing the eligibility for a pension from 65 to 67. Uh, there would have been uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, openness, I believe, at that forum and on the world stage about uh, tackling income inequality uh, as a major factor of, uh, of uh, economic instability. It's clear that as you're increasing or decreasing those inequalities, you're actually increasing stability in, uh, in world economics, and uh, that part was actually missing from the inter intervention from the Prime Minister. All right, Lisa Ray, a quick question to you. Uh, the Conservatives set the date for their leadership convention, May 27th, 2017. Uh, a lot of people think uh, you're going to enter that race. Does that date help you make up your mind? Does it look more positive for you? Or do you think that could hurt someone that would be in it for such a long haul? Uh, I'm out here in Vancouver with uh, the leader of the opposition, Ronna Ambrose, talking to Canadians uh, about issues regarding the economy. And what she said today is very true about our date, which is it's going to allow all kinds of people to make decisions, both from the inside and the outside, of whether or not they want to be part of a very exciting leadership race. Now, I'm going to tell you that I will be part of the leadership race. What capacity I'll be in the leadership race, I still haven't decided I'm getting there. But uh, it's getting more and more exciting, the, the prospects of of um, talking about how we would solve the problems Canada has as Conservatives. You're going to help lead uh, Kevin O'Leary's campaign if you don't run yourself? Is Kevin O'Leary running? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just had to throw that out there. I'm just being difficult. All, all will right. be revealed, we'll Don. You'll know first. All right. Thank you all for joining me. A busy day and a lot to discuss, and, and you did it very well. Thank you.